Turn to Romans chapter 1. I want to talk about Paul's three Gospels um, and uh, over the course of whatever it takes. But I want to start tonight in Romans chapter 1. Notice verse 1. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Then I know <coughs> that there's a gospel there named the gospel of God. And uh, as I once heard Brother Moore say, or on more than one occasion I heard he and Jerry and other preachers say, that things that are different are not the same, then there's a good reason to see that the gospel of God <coughs> would not be the same as other gospels. We talk about the gospel of Christ and, and spend a lot of time sort of showing the difference between the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom. And, and well, we should, and it's good that we do. And yet the gospel of God seems to be something separated out from the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom. So I'm going to write on the board up here the gospel of God. Um, but keep in mind, it's not the first gospel preached in your so-called New Testament. The first thing preached in the New Testament we would find would be the gospel of the kingdom. So, I'm going to put it above it on the board, not because of its importance, but because of its earlier date. And you say, well, how do you know they're, they're different? Well, we know what the gospel of the kingdom is. And, uh, you know, you could turn there. You don't need to. But Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, after Christ chooses the twelve disciples, he says, These twelve Jesus sent forth, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, unto any city of the Samaritans, unto you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 24, round about verse 13 or so, he states, uh, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So I know that the gospel of the kingdom could not be that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again. Because he's preaching it. John preached it before Christ in Matthew 3. Christ begins to preach it in Matthew 4. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and trains the twelve and sends them forth to preach it, and tells them they're going to preach it till the end. <clears throat> but the kingdom gospel doesn't include anything about Jesus Christ dying. The twelve disciples in Matthew 16 didn't understand why he had to die. Well, the gospel of God then uh, comes after the gospel of the kingdom, and it states... Verse 2, that it had been promised by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So somewhere in the Holy Scriptures, I should be able to find the gospel of God, and you can. Um, and it's not necessarily that we have to go back there to find what it is, because he states it in verse 3. If I skip the parentheses of verse 2, I could read it like this, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, verse 3, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Then the gospel of God is words to this effect. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the seed of David, but he's declared to be the Son of God, and that was done by the resurrection from the dead. His being raised from the dead was that which declared him to be the Son of God. Now, the Gospel of God. Um, Paul said he was separated under that Gospel. Before I go any further in Romans, I want you to notice that Peter 
also preached this gospel. So you can hold there in Romans 1, and if you will, turn to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 is, of course, the, the day of Pentecost when the disciples began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And after they're accused of being drunk by the Jews that heard them, they begin to preach. Now notice in verse 14, for the context, Acts 2.14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. So he's talking to Jews. Israelites there at the time for the Pentecost feast. Come down to verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, this is still Peter preaching. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. By the way, right there <clears throat> counteracts what some would say about, well, who killed Jesus? I killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. We all killed him. I don't agree with that. Uh, that's something that I think the director Mel Gibson said about his recent movie. Uh, it's also something I've heard other preachers preach, but I don't agree with that. I didn't kill him. He died for me. Jesus Christ gave himself for my sins. He offered himself up freely. It was delivered, or rather, it was, uh, <clears throat> he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God to be slain by the Jews. I, I, never mind the fact that the Romans physically beat him and forced the nails into him and everything else. They did so at the request and, and, you know, at the behest of the Jews that did not want him to be their king. Now, does this make me anti-Semitic? Of course not. Christ died for all men. He said at Calvary, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The sin's not laid to their account any differently than any other sin is today laid to any other person's account. And as of right now, God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is, Christ died for all our trespasses. Yet, these men are the ones who were guilty of it. They has, I, I get the impression that they are the ones that were there in the mob screaming for Christ to be crucified some 40 days prior to this. And he was crucified at Passover... And, well, I guess it's 50 days after is the Pentecost. So, likely, if a man traveled from a far country to make the Feast of Pentecost, he probably could have come for the Passover and stayed through that time. So, that's probably what's going on here. Nevertheless, the accusation is against Israel at that time for the murder of Jesus Christ. He said, you by wicked hands are crucified and slain, verse 24, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So he preaches Jesus. He preaches him raised from the dead. And he talks about David not being the one that's in the tomb. <clears throat> he says in, verse, in the psalm, he quotes in verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now skip to verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Well, then he's confirming the same thing Paul has confirmed in Romans chapter 1. Jesus Christ is of the seed of David, according to the flesh. He's raised from the dead. And notice verse 31, he, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. 
Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord. <clears throat> in other words, it's like God the Father said unto Jesus Christ, the Son. The Lord said unto my Lord, verse 34, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So Peter confirms in this preaching here to the men of Israel, Jesus is the Christ. He's Lord, the Son of the living God, as he stated back in Matthew 16. <clears throat> and God raised him from the dead. He, he affirms his lineage to David. In essence, he's speaking the gospel of God there. And yet, he goes on to say, verse 37, Now when they heard this, the, the Jews he's preaching to, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What did he not say? <clears throat> he did not say, Believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and raised again. That's something else altogether. We're going to get to that in a moment. There's something else Peter did not say there. <clears throat> he did not say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, they've been preaching the gospel of the kingdom for three and a half years in, in training, in, in the time that Jesus Christ trained them to preach in his earthly ministry. But notice back in Acts chapter 1 for just a moment. Excuse me, before you go there. Sure. Uh, Acts 2.22 all the way to 37 uh -huh. is the gospel of God, right? Well, I, and I'm about to throw another monkey wrench in there. But I was going to say, does 38 qualify that and become the gospel of the kingdom? It, 38 qualifies it as the gospel of the circumcision, if you ask me. Okay. And that's what I want to show you next. Because, first of all, the reason why it couldn't be the gospel of the kingdom... In, in the, I mean, we're being technical here. We're splitting hairs a little bit. But it, it, you, I don't have a problem if you call it the gospel of the kingdom. It concerns the kingdom. But there's an element missing from the message. And it's found in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Before Jesus Christ ascended up in, in glory to heaven, they were gathered together. And it says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of them, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time... Restore again the kingdom to Israel. And that's a natural question to ask after they've been preaching for three and a half years. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they're asking, is now the time for the kingdom? And verse 7, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. And in effect, he reaffirms that they're to go out and do what he told them to do. <clears throat> With one thing missing. A time factor. You cannot find in the book of Acts anywhere that a kingdom saint, apostle, preacher says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You just find them saying repent and be baptized. Repent and be converted. Well, what changes about that? Just the time. It's still the kingdom. So technically, you can say it's the gospel of the kingdom. But the time element is not there anymore. And according to Galatians chapter 2, you can turn to Galatians 2. <clears throat> when did you say you would never hear them saying it's at hand? After the they, nowhere in the book of Acts do any of those preachers of the kingdom message say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if they did, it would be in a violation of what Christ just told them in Acts 1-7. It's not for you to know. Now, that is in contrast to what they had been preaching, so they couldn't continue to preach. It's at hand. They had to leave that out. They simply continued the preaching of the kingdom that included repent and be baptized, and Paul, or somebody, calls that the gospel of the circumcision. Look in Galatians 2, verse 7. <clears throat> 
and I'm, I don't want to get into all the details of this meeting here, but after this meeting, it was determined that, verse 7, but contrary wise, when they, and they turns out to be, verse 9, James, Cephas, and John. At least those three. Cephas is Peter. And they, back in verse 7, when they saw what, that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Well, then Peter preached, you know, you can call it the gospel of the kingdom, that's fine, but an offshoot of the gospel of God is the gospel of the circumcision. Now, remember, I started this lesson off saying, I was going to show you the three Gospels that Paul preached. But I'm wanting to show you this for a reason. The Gospel of God is a foundation for both the Gospel of the circumcision, which Peter preached, and we just read it. And like I said, the Gospel of the Kingdom was preached before the Gospel of God was a part of it. Because he not yet died and been raised from the dead. So I see a little bit of a technicality difference in the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the kingdom. You understand? But the point is, the foundation of the gospel of the circumcision, as far as I am concerned, includes the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead. But nowhere in that preaching in Acts 2 did Peter say, He died for your sins. He may know that truth. Or he may not at the time. <clears throat> and if he learned it at all, he probably learned it from Paul. But there's, because I know he learned it in Galatians chapter 2, which was the meeting of Acts 15. But nevertheless, he doesn't preach it because they still had to endure to the end to be saved. The elements of the gospel of the kingdom are in the gospel of the circumcision. The difference being the time factor of the kingdom being at hand, and the gospel of God being a foundation for it. Now then, Paul, though, back in Romans 1, said that he was called or separated unto the gospel of God. He said what it was. Let's see where he preached it. And by the way, um, before you go to that verse I want you to go to next, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I, I guess what I'm going to do here is just give a little bit more confirmation to the fact that Peter preached the gospel of God. I think we saw it pretty clear there in Acts chapter 2. But just in case someone has a problem with it, notice that <clears throat> Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And he certainly preaches then the gospel of God in his teaching. Well, so did Paul. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we're going to do something here. You can grab Acts 17 if you want to now, because we're going to go there in just a few minutes. But we're going to look at the historical... Um, scenario that brought Paul to Thessalonica to get a bit of an understanding of why it may be that the things fell out the way they did there. Look in verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And by the way, the writers uh, or the ones addressing the Thessalonians in chapter 1 verse 1 are Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. Okay? Let's try to remember those three. Now, chapter 2 verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Then I know he preached the gospel of God. He doesn't say that once. He says that uh, two times, maybe, no, three times. Look in verse 8. <clears throat> So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, 
but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. So they imparted the gospel of God unto them. They spoke the gospel of God unto them. Verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Now, if anybody comes away not understanding that Paul spoke the gospel of God at Thessalonica, <laughs> I'm a failure, and, uh, you know, the Bible is not clear. But it looks very clear to me. Now then, he talked about contention back in verse 2. They spoke it with much contention. And he mentioned they had suffered uh, before. And he also mentioned um, in, uh, let me see if I can find it quickly, um, verse 17. It says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So the indication is <clears throat> they left Thessalonica before something had been done that was needed to be done or, or that Paul desired to do. Let's see if we can figure out what that is. Hold on there to First Thessalonians. We're going to come back to chapter 3 in just a moment. And if you will, grab Acts chapter 17. Now we're going to look at the reference, the history of Paul going to Thessalonica. Look at verse 1. Acts 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. <clears throat> By the way, where could you find the gospel of God in Paul's day? In the scriptures, yes, thank you. He's speaking it in the synagogue, so you guys aren't incorrect. That's another place you'd find it, but I, I guess my question was worded poorly. Where would you find it to speak it in the synagogue? You'd find it in the scriptures of the Old Testament. And this is what he says in verse 3. He used the scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Well, that's the gospel of God. And he said he preached it to him three times there in the letter he wrote to him. So there's no doubt about it. He preaches the truth about this. Now then, verse 4 says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Silas would be Silvanus, I believe. I'm pretty sure that is correct. Silas was probably his nickname in the same way Timothy was short for Timotheus. Okay? So it says, Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. In other words, there's a, there's a mob there, upset with Paul and Silas, apparently. Notice verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And of course, verse 11 is the verse that we get the name from, calling this Berean Bible Fellowship. A Berea, uh, or a Berean, is somebody described there in verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. But the point is, Paul and Silas had to leave Thessalonica, maybe in a hurry. I know that it's, the indication is, based upon verse 2, that Paul only spent three weeks, three Sabbath days, would be three Sabbaths in a row, which would make it oh, three weeks, in Thessalonica. And what he did in that time was he preached the gospel of God to them. And that makes perfect sense to me. He's in a synagogue of the Jews. He's speaking to Jews and Greeks that know the scriptures. 
And he's proving by the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ and that it was necessary that he suffer and be raised from the dead. The gospel of God. Go ahead. In verse 11, <coughs> these were more noble than those. <coughs> these are the Jews at Berea the, versus the those <coughs> Jews those Jews at it's, it, he's referring to the, those at Thessalonica. He's referring to the unbelieving Jews and the ones that stirred up trouble for him at Thessalonica. Obviously, the ones who did believe, notice back in verse 4, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So there's a number of believers that did come along. Uh, it's apparently some Jews, but a large number of Greeks. Well, it says these were more noble. He didn't say these were noble, but more noble. More noble. You're right. And, and why were they more noble? Because they searched it out. They did the right thing, and that's why we adopt the name of a Berean. We want to do the right thing by checking out the man of God by the Scriptures and not accepting what people had to say on the basis of just because they're a preacher. They would be checking out the scriptures that testified about the Messiah, the coming of Christ, and why he had to suffer, like the Psalms that testified to the Lord saith unto my Lord back there in Acts 2, like Isaiah chapter 53 that talked about his sufferings and on and on. So there was a number of things. Psalm 18, that's right. I mean, any number of things they could have done. It would have gone to Daniel chapter 9. Not the time thing. They very well could have gone to Daniel chapter 9. And there wouldn't have been any reason why they shouldn't have concerning when Messiah would come. Messiah the Prince. It's referred to there in verse 27 of Daniel 9. So, now that we've established that Paul preached the gospel of God in Thessalonica and had to get out of there... Uh, we find that he goes to Berea, and then there are those that believe, verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. These Jews in Thessalonica that don't believe really hate Paul, following him to another city and persecuting him. Verse 14, and then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. So Silas and Timothy are at Berea. Did you see that? And Paul goes to Athens. Verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So the ones that conducted Paul to Athens got a commandment from Paul. When you go back to Berea... Join me in Athens with all speed. But it looks like that wasn't all that was in the commandment, and it doesn't necessarily have to lay out this way. But the indication seems that Paul either said, Come quickly to me, and when they got there, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica, or it could be that he sent the commandment and said, Timothy, go to Thessalonica. Silas, you come to me. And then Timothy would join him later. And here's why I know that. Go back to Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 1. Now remember, he was taken from them a short time in presence in chapter 2, verse 17. And he wanted to go to them again in verse 18 of chapter 2. But chapter 3, verse 1 says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear... We thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, and on and on. Then there's something very interesting here. Paul is at Athens, and apparently Silas with him. So one way or the other, like I said, one of those two scenarios played out. Either Timothy went down to Athens and was sent by Paul back to Thessalonica, or word was sent that he should do that uh, when, when, when the commandment was brought back to Silas and Timothy at Berea, and Silas joined him in Athens. And the point is, Timothy went back to Thessalonica. However it played out, 
And it says he was sent to establish them and to comfort you concerning your faith. And he calls him a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Now, the gospel of Christ we're going to get into in the next, in more detail, in the next session that we do about this. But I want you to notice something about that. Go back to Romans chapter 1. And, and we can, well, before you turn there, let me, let me do this. He goes, and um, verse 6 he returns to Athens. Timothy goes back to Thessalonica, and verse 6 says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction, and on and on. And uh, <clears throat> I guess that's all we need to see of that. We need to see that he went... And he was sent for the purpose of establishing them. Okay? Now, go back to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we find that these at Rome, we'll leave the Thessalonians for just a moment. We'll come back to them shortly. But these at Rome, he addresses them in verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch. Verse 8 says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Then the Romans, whoever they are, have a faith that's well known. And Paul thanked God for their faith. Whatever it is in, they have a faith. He says in verse 9, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son which could be another way to say the gospel of Christ, but would still be distinct from the gospel of God. It could be either one, because the gospel of God concerns his son, and the gospel of Christ, as we'll see, is the gospel God uh, Paul received from his son. But I'm inclined to think that he's talking about the gospel of Christ here. Yet the point being, he's praying for them, verse 10, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So Paul has never been to Rome. He wants to see them. He wants to meet them. Verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. Paul had something he wanted to give them. He called it a gift, a spiritual gift. The end of it would be that they would be established. Now, they have a faith that's spoken of throughout the whole world, but they're not established. Paul reasoned three Sabbath days in Thessalonica preaching the gospel of God, but sent Timothy back to establish the Thessalonians. He was worried about them. He couldn't forbear any longer. He sent Timothy back. And remember, it's a dangerous situation in Thessalonica. These Jews are trying to stir people up to kill Paul, and and they have to flee. Paul and Silas and Timothy. So he wants to establish them, verse 12, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, they have a faith in something at Rome. But there's not a mutual faith, at least not to the extent that that Paul is comforted by it. Why? Because they're not established. He longs to see them that he might impart to them a spiritual gift to the end they would be established. What has he hoping to impart unto them? He says in verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, meaning I was restrained from coming up to this point, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Well, then who are these Romans? They're Gentiles. So far, that's all we know. And they have a faith in something. Verse 14, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Then Paul hasn't preached the gospel at Rome, has he? Never been there. 
but he's ready to preach it. And then verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, what is God's power to save an individual? It's the gospel of Christ. The gospel of God had to be believed by those that Peter preached unto, but their salvation was in them repenting and being baptized and enduring to the end and all the other things associated with the kingdom message. The gospel of God wouldn't save anybody that Paul preached to either. He had to establish, though, at that time, to the Jews and also to the Greek, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. If he couldn't show that out of the scriptures, what would they do believing that he died for their sins? And if he isn't the Son of God, and on and on, then the fact that he died for your sins would mean absolutely nothing. Because that would be no different than me dying for your sins if he's not the Son of God. He's just another man, and his death meant nothing as far as eternity is concerned. But he says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Now, we're not going to turn there today because of time, but the gospel of Christ is found in 1 Corinthians 15. And it refers to the fact that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again the third day. And we'll deal with the scripture part of it later. But I want you to hold on there in Romans 1 and turn to Romans 16 for just a moment. And keep in mind that Paul's desire to go to Rome was to preach the gospel to them. And it's the power of God unto salvation. So he needs to show it to them in order that they might get saved. And yet they've got a faith in something. Well, in verse 25 of Romans 16, Paul closes his letter and says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, and that's the same word as established in Greek, uh, now to him that is power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now, the gospel of God was in the scriptures. We saw that very clearly. But it was never referred to as a mystery. Though men may, not all men may have understood it, yet men could know it, couldn't they? I mean, we were talking about what scriptures would, would you turn to in the Old Testament to know about the gospel of God and they're abundant Russell mentioned Daniel 9 somebody mentioned Psalm 18 Doug said and then I talked about Isaiah 53 and there's numerous others even so much so that there were some people that knew the time the day of the arrival of the king for they laid palm leaves on the ground and cried out Hosanna to God in the highest and on and on and because they knew about him coming in uh, the book of uh, is it Ezekiel, lowly and meek and riding on the colt, the foal of an ass? Or Zechariah? I, I forget. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have even brought it up. But you know the verse I'm talking about. He referred, In other words, they knew they could recognize the time. They knew he was Messiah the Prince. They could tell. In fact, even... Even the Pharisees that rejected Jesus Christ, he said a parable in Matthew 21 and said, in the parable, they, the Lord of the vineyard sent the son and they, the, the wicked husbandman said, come, this is the heir. Let us kill him and seize on his inheritance. I believe it's Matthew 21. And so they recognized the son of God there. They just didn't believe on him. So you'd have to believe first that he's the Son of God before you would be willing to submit yourselves in water baptism for remission of sins and selling all that you had and having all things common and enduring to the end. But you'd also have to, as a Jew at that time for certain, you'd have to be convinced that Jesus of Nazareth, that criminal that was hanged on a cross in the mind of most of the world in Jerusalem, was the Christ. And so Paul spent the time reasoning and opening and alleging out of the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, proving it that God raised him from the dead. 
And he could read those Psalms and he could read those passages in the prophets to show that God had to raise him from the dead. But the gospel of Christ is what establishes you. Verse 25 again, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets and on and on. It's being made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets but it was a mystery. And it will establish you in what? In salvation. Go back to Romans 1 and look at it again. That's the gospel of Christ, right? That's the gospel of Christ. His gospel that would establish you would match verse 11 of Romans chapter 1. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. Yeah, that's right. There are those that would teach that. A spiritual gift was a sign gift. But that's not what Paul wanted to give them. He wanted to give them something that would establish them that he might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now then, if you ask me, it looks to me like what the Romans had a faith in may have been the gospel of God. He affirms his apostleship under that gospel and then praises them for their faith and then says, I want to see you because you're lacking something. You're not established. We are of the mutual faith. I long to see you to impart unto you a gift. And it's the gospel of Christ. It would establish them and it's the power of God unto salvation, verse 16. To everyone that believeth. So they're not saved in the sense of you and I that are sitting in this room. If they were kingdom saints, and I'm not saying that they were, but if they were kingdom saints, even they aren't saved. They're enduring to the end to be saved. There's no indication these are kingdom saints. But they're called Gentiles. And in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, he says, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. So I know there's some form of a Gentile here, but they're a little bit different than other Gentiles uh, in, in several respects, which we'll get into probably later. Now, he talks about the gospel of Christ being the power of God unto salvation in verse 16. And in verse 17, he says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. That is, God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel of Christ. And he goes on to describe that the wrath of God, which is what you'd want to be saved from, is going to be revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And he begins to describe man that does that. And the wicked fruit that results from him as in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, on and on. Then come to chapter 2 and notice verse 1. By the way, he's addressing the letter to all that be at Rome. Is that one guy or more than one person? Obviously more than one, quite a few. Well, in a King James Bible, when you're using a pronoun to describe a group of people, it's always ye, you, yours. When you're talking to a single individual, it's thee, thou, thy, and thine. That bears out clarity. It doesn't cloud things. It makes it clearer. So he's writing this letter to all that be at Rome, and then all of a sudden in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another... Thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Well, is there some guy there at Rome that's contentious and judgmental? Could be. Or maybe Paul's using it describing any one individual, uh, I certainly there at Rome, but in more of a hypothetical sense. Whoever this man is, it's one guy. And maybe he's talking to the heart of an individual, no matter who he be. But he's 
who is old man. Well, that's what I mean. He come, he's referred to several times in the book of Romans. Paul writes to a plural group of people there, we, us, ye, using those pronouns throughout the letter, and then every now and then he goes back to the man. <laughs> you, old man, thou. Man, is he referring to humanity? Or? Don't know yet. I mean, as we read, we don't know. What we know about this man, whether he's hypothetical or a person that Paul knows and just didn't want to call him out by name, or has heard of him or whatever, I'm inclined to think it's, it would apply to a particular group of people, but individually. First thing I know about them is that they're judging, and they're no different. Judging against those inexcusable, uh, excuse me, against those uh, iniquities that he describes in chapter 1, and then he says, Thou art inexcusable in chapter 2, verse 1, because you judge and you condemn yourself. Verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them, which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Who would stand in judgment against the world that holds the truth in unrighteousness? Just a lost individual that doesn't know up or down, or somebody who was maybe religious? A Jew. Or someone who is (coughs) called a Jew. Okay? But notice what he says in verse 4. Or despisest thou, he's still talking to the man, thou, O man, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Is this man hypothetical or no, is he saved? How could he be if he's treasuring up wrath unto himself by his rejection and impenitent heart? Why, he's the man that's holding the truth and unrighteousness, and it's not just among those reprobates in chapter 1, it's among this judgmental religious person, the man that judges. Okay, come down to verse um, 17. He's still addressing the man. And he says, Behold, thou art called a Jew. Well, that's interesting. He's writing to all that be at Rome, and he said they were Gentiles in chapter 1 and chapter 11, verse 13. But here he says, Thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. Well, here's the religious man, isn't it? He's a religious Jew. But the indication would seem to be that he's a Gentile that got circumcised. Look down to verse... 25, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So these are called Jews, and they're circumcised. Now, it's a man he's talking to here. So whoever the man is, and I, again, I believe he's trying to talk to the heart of an individual. Uh, I've heard preachers say that Paul didn't write to lost individuals. And I agree with that, with the one exception of this man. It would make sense in a a way. Paul's writing to a man that might have some faith, but more than likely, the ones that have faith are the ones he called brethren. There's somebody here that maybe Paul just knew by the Spirit of God was more than one individual, but he's addressing them individually at Rome, And he's saying, okay, but then there's you, and thee, thou, O man, are judging, and thou thinkest thy have it all together, because thou thinks you're keeping the law, and on and on. He's calling out a religious man who doesn't seem to have the same faith, though that may not be true, but one thing he does place a faith in is the law and his ability to keep it. And I'm not so sure that Paul would praise that faith in light of what he's about to say in Romans chapter 3. But he does 
thank God for the faith of those that be at Rome. But the man here, he says, verse 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision, which would be a Gentile, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, the man, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now, first of all, this is not saying you get saved, you become a spiritual Jew. Because the Bible says that in Christ Jesus there's neither Jew nor Greek, or Jew nor Gentile, there's neither male nor female, neither bond nor free, in Christ. Now come on, are we physically male and female? Are we physically Jew and Greek? Of course. Then he must mean in Christ we are spiritually neither Jew nor Gentile. Well then how can you be a spiritual Jew in the body of Christ? He's talking to somebody, apparently, who is a Gentile that is boasting in circumcision. And in effect, it's like he's saying, you're not made a Jew just because of circumcision. I could say today, and make it more current, you're not a Christian just because you're baptized in water, or speak with tongues, or confirmation, or whatever. In other words, he's talking to a religious man here who's boasting in his circumcision or trusting in it, one, and he's trying to say to them, hey, you're no different. And in chapter 3, he says in verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. In verse 20, Well, verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So he establishes what the law's purpose is. And then he says in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It's being manifested in the gospel of Christ. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel of Christ. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. This religious man, O man, appears several times in the book of Romans. And we'll probably deal with him later in another study. But I just want to establish the fact that Paul preached the gospel of God first, and then it looks like at Rome he's writing to tell them, I want to establish you in the gospel of Christ. Back in the Thessalonian letter, it looks like he sent Timothy back to establish them in the gospel of Christ. His manner was to reason three Sabbath days out of the scriptures and prove the gospel of God. Once he did that for the sake of the Jew and the Greek, then he would establish them in the gospel of Christ.